It is no exaggeration to say that Half-Life's opening is one of the greatest moments in video game history. A 15 minute or so long section introducing you to the world of Gordon Freeman and his workplace at Black Mesa, its presentation and ingenuity was so ridiculously far ahead of any other shooter available at the time that I could scarcely believe what I was playing when I first got my hands on it. To understand just how extraordinary it was, I want you to cast your minds back to 1998, if you can, and think about what first person shooters were like at the time. Time. You had your Dooms and you had your Quakes on PC, and the genre was still very much in its infancy on consoles, although the 3D era had begun to usher in new and exciting experiences such as Goldeneye. However, in general, I'd say there was a distinct lack of cinematic quality across the genre. Then Half-Life came along and changed everything. Describing it as good doesn't do it justice, describing it as incredible doesn't do it justice. Half-Life was something else entirely. When I booted it up for the first time, I was immediately lost for words, because while nowadays there are plenty of first-person shooters that include sections focused more on immersing yourself in your environment rather than on blasting things, back then there just wasn't. Shooters were mostly about getting from point A to point B while killing a lot of things in between, and story and world building nearly always played second fiddle to gameplay, and so for Half-Life to go against the grain as confidently as it does was frankly stunning. Not only were Valve brave enough to introduce the idea into their game at all, they included it at Half-Life's very beginning through its tram ride, which for the time was an outrageous risk to take. You are immediately put into the shoes of Gordon Freeman and never leave them again, and Valve puts their trust in you the player to not get bored and lose interest due to the lack of action during these early stages. It was world building the likes of which had never been seen before, world building which immediately catapulted Half-Life into the consciousness of gamers the world over. Indeed, it was a statement of intent by Valve which said, don't worry, you'll still get to shoot things, a lot. But we want you to feel like part of a living, breathing world, the world of Black Mesa first. Black Mesa is where Gordon works every day, and so that makes perfect sense. Before everything gets out of hand, you spend a few minutes of a regular morning simply gazing at the forlorn, grey and brown, barren military industrial base you find yourself in, absorbing the world around you, so that when the inevitable disaster does occur, its consequences are felt far more acutely as a result. Granted, it's hardly the traditional commuter journey to the office to begin with, there's no denying that, but nevertheless, it does a great job of grounding you to the environment you find yourself in like no other first person shooter had ever managed prior to its release. You're not the biggest baddest fish in the pond, a faceless nameless instrument of death like so many other testosterone fueled space marines who tear everything they encounter from limb to limb. You are a minnow surrounded by other minnows in a world so much bigger, so much more complex, so much more mysterious than you ever could have imagined. In other shooters on the market at the time, you were the main man or woman, but in Black Mesa you're just another cog in the wheel, one small part of a gigantic scientific machine. Black Mesa was there before you arrived, and it will be there after you're gone. You just happen to be there at exactly the right, or perhaps wrong, moment. It's so beautifully seamless, and in a way claustrophobic in equal measure, as you're taken deeper into the facility while watching scientists and soldiers stop for a chat, or enormous machines go about their daily routines. The tram ride is impressive enough on its own, but everything which follows is equally spectacular. Before you're given the opportunity to shoot your way out of Black Mesa, you have to take part in an experiment. And to do that, you first have to wander the halls Freeman walks every day, interacting with people and visiting places that would have been very familiar to him. There are no cuts, no additional cinematic flourishes. You experience the environment exactly as Freeman perceives it, no matter how mundane or exciting that may be. Valve pushes you to immerse yourself in the environment in its most usual form, so that the transition to alien and infested hellhole not long after is felt as acutely as possible. Like the tram ride prior, these moments spent mingling with colleagues, learning the layout of the facility and preparing to get to work make everything feel incredibly grounded. You become familiar with your surroundings and they quickly begin to feel lived in, helping put you on equal footing with Freeman himself. Characters speak to you, they refer to you by name. Hey Mr. Freeman, I had a bunch of messages for you, but we had a system crash about 20 minutes ago and I'm still trying to find my files. Just one of those days, I guess. They were having some problems down in the test chamber too, but I think that's all straightened out. They told me to make sure you headed down there as soon as you got into your hazard suit. They have issues with vending machines. Most of the simulation results are perfectly acceptable, you know. And they even have workplace debates. Don't you think we should recalculate those resonance dampening factors again? 
You are completely wrong. In other first-person shooters, rarely a minute would go by without something needing to be shot, and interacting with non-player characters or having them interact with you was practically unheard of, and that's because Half-Life not only popularised these slower, more finely paced moments, but also the idea of supplementing them with scripted set pieces. There's a great deal of attention paid to ensuring it feels like Gordon is simply a product of unforeseen circumstances, just trying to muddle his way through events as best he can, rather than a heroic character predestined to save the world. World. There may be some of you watching who haven't heard of the term scripted set piece before, but you likely would have seen quite a few of them, even if you're not familiar with the expression. A scripted event could be anything from a character beginning their dialogue when you enter a certain room, to the scene you're seeing on screen right now of a scientist trying to revive their fallen colleague. They are predetermined events, which will occur as soon as you perform whatever action is necessary for them to begin, for example by picking something up or walking past a certain point. These are in direct comparison to non-scripted events. For for example, a battle against one of Half-Life's numerous groups of marines, where your enemies use AI to react to your actions on the fly. In shooters released prior to Half-Life, like Doom, you would usually know what to expect from each level. You'd be presented with a number of corridors and rooms filled with demons needing to be slayed, and you'd need to navigate that maze-like environment to find the keys and the doors they unlocked in order to progress. By contrast, in Half-Life, the introduction of set pieces meant almost anything could happen. Other shooters would dole out exposition entirely through cutscenes if they did it at all, but in Half-Life, exposition constantly occurred around you. In one fell swoop, Half-Life illustrated how much better things could be and completely changed gamers' expectations of what immersion in a first-person shooter was really all about. And of course, I can't talk about Half-Life's opening without also mentioning the fact that you never transition from one loading screen to another. You take a ride on the tram, you explore the facility's upper area, you head deeper inside to take part in the experiment, and then you battle your way back out again when everything goes goes wrong. Other than a brief pause to load in the next area, you're never taken away from the action, and this again had not only never been done before to the extent it is in Half-Life, but it also ensured that Black Mesa felt like one enormous, cohesive environment from the moment you set foot in it, right up until the game's conclusion. In short, Half-Life's opening is a gaming tour de force that defies conventions from its very start with its opening tram ride, and then all at once immediately after proceeds to show off everything else that elevated it far beyond any other first-person shooter available at the time. The start of Gordon Freeman's day may be fairly mundane up until he takes part in the fateful experiment, but the way Valve handled events leading up to it is anything but. It was truly groundbreaking game design, and I'd argue that makes Half-Life's opening one of the most important moments in gaming history. Thanks for watching the video, boys, girls, and theoretical physicists. If you enjoyed it, do consider subscribing to the channel and sharing your memories of Half-Life with me, and hopefully we'll catch up again soon.